Good afternoon to you. Happy Wednesday, or as some folks might say, happy hump day. I'm Dr. G. Christine Taylor, and I serve as the Vice President and Associate Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. I also have the honor of being the conference planning chair for this year's Alajado Conference. We were initially scheduled to be here uh, in Tuscaloosa, but we know what COVID has done to us. However, uh, we've been able to do a wonderful set of webinars that are focusing on critical issues that while COVID has slowed us down, it cannot stop the important work that we have done. Uh, yesterday, we started off really strong talking about how to focus on leading in a time of crisis. And that's so important for the theme of our conference this year, which is power, privilege, equity, and voice, critical lessons for and from 2020. Well, I don't know about you, but today's topic I think is such an important, important one. And I am so delighted to, to welcome our presenter today. Our session topic today is hard white the mainstreaming of racism in American politics. And I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Richard Fording, who is going to serve as our presenter. Let me tell you a bit about Dr. Fording as we begin. Dr. Fording is the Marilyn Williams Elmore and John Dur Elmore Endowed Professor of Political Science here at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. He earned his BA at the University of Florida, his PhD from Florida State University. His primary teaching and research interests include public policy, race and politics, state politics, social movements, and quantitative methodology. He's the author or co-author of articles appearing in a variety of journals, including American Political Science Review, American Sociological Review, American Journal of Political Science, American Journal of Sociology, and the Journal of Politics. He's a co-author of Disciplining the Poor, Neoliberal Paternalism and the Persistent Power of Race, published by the University of Chicago Press. And his most recent release and the title of today's presentation, Hard White, The Mainstreaming of Racism in American Politics from Oxford University, published by them. Uh, Dr. Fording is gonna be presenting to us, just a reminder to you that this is gonna be interactive so there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. We ask that you post them um, in the Q&A section and at the conclusion of his presentation, we'll begin to entertain as many as we possibly can. So to that end, Dr. Fording, thank you so much and welcome to Alajado's conference. Thank you, Dr. Taylor for the wonderful introduction. <clears throat> and thank you everyone in the audience for for being here today. And I'm really delighted and honored to be able to uh, speak to you today about uh, the research that we report in our recently published book, published back in August of, of 2020. So it was just prior to the, to the election. And uh, it's, uh, although I'm a political scientist and uh, you know, I think you know, this has implications for uh, what many of you do uh, the diversity work that you do on our campuses. And so I do have some, some uh, time that I built into the presentation sort of to talk about how uh, this phenomenon of, of mainstreaming that I'm gonna be talking about has uh, infiltrated our, our campuses and, and why. Um, and uh, I'm sure many of you all have already had some experience with this. So I wanna begin by uh, just sort of defining what we mean by mainstreaming. Uh, what we mean and what you may have understood us to mean is uh, what we are generally talking about is the movement from the extremist fringe, uh, extremist you know, political fringe to the political mainstream. Uh, and by fringe, uh, we mean sort of, you know, protest politics, you know, uh, sort of, Kind of roped off from our conventional political institutions and processes, and by political mainstream, we mean you know um, you know electoral politics, uh, political institutions, and you know also you know our our major parties, political parties. So what exactly has been mainstreamed? Well, um, 
these are some terms that I'm going to use throughout the presentation and that we use throughout the book. Um, you're going to hear me use this term white racial extremists uh, many times throughout the presentation. And what we re refer to uh, here, uh, we're talking about uh, voters or potential voters, citizens who hold extremely uh, hostile views toward uh, what they consider to be racial outgroups. Uh, we're, uh, what else has been mainstreamed? White nationalist and white supremacist activists. So the white racial extremists are just kind of ordinary people who may or may not be participating in, in politics. Uh, actually, they tend to participate less in, in politics usually. Uh, white nationalists and white supremacist activists, these are people, the, the small percentage of white racial extremists who participate in the white nationalist movement uh, through you know, uh, movement organizations. Uh, so people have been mainstream. Their uh, organizations have become mainstream, uh, mainstreamed. Uh, ideas have become mainstream, in particular, uh, white nationalist uh, ideology. And uh, a term that we use to refer to an important part of that ideology is outgroup hostility or an expression of that, that ideology. And then finally, uh, racialized rhetoric in the form of what we, what we call racialized political narratives. Uh, this is uh, rhetoric um, that comes from movement leaders uh, within the white nationalist movement and, and um, you know, more commonly now, and that's the mainstreaming part from mainstream political candidates. Uh, in, the, in the book, we um, kind of distinguish between uh, two levels of mainstreaming, uh, what we call or term elite level mainstreaming and, and mass level mainstreaming. So elite level mainstreaming, it's just a way of sort of organizing the different ways that, that mainstreaming is, is happening and why. Um, elite level mainstreaming refers to actions by leaders, um, whether they be, you know, mainstream political candidates or office holders or uh, movement leaders and even elites within the, the various forms of mass media. Mass level mainstream, and here we're talking about uh, uh, citizens, voters, uh, and activists. So I, I think, you know, the place to begin uh, is with Donald Trump because I, I think whether you, you know, read a, any of the blurbs for the book or uh, even though we don't mention Donald Trump, you might have guessed that um, this book has something to do with Donald Trump and, and it does. Um, this is how uh, I'd been studying the white nationalist movement actually for several years before uh, Trump announced his candidacy in 2015. But, um, you know, this, this obviously very much um, has to do with, with Donald Trump's behavior and sort of strategy and how he came to power. Uh, so many of you, um, most of you perhaps will remember when Donald Trump announced that he was running for president in 2015. Um, he came down the escalator, gave his little speech. Of course, later we find out many of those audience members that were sort of paid to be there. Um, and there's, you know, maybe the most famous quote or section of that speech uh, had to do with, with the way he spoke about um, Latin American immigrants, Mexican immigrants in particular, uh, where he uh, referred to them as criminals, rapists, and some perhaps, you know, being good people. Uh, certainly that stood out and we knew that, you know, we were shocked by that. Uh, uh, but I don't think, you know, many people took his candidacy seriously. I know I didn't, and obviously the New York Daily News didn't, didn't either. Um, we should have, and eventually, you know, we did. Uh, but it probably came, you know, much too late. Not that there would have been much we could have done about it, perhaps. Uh, about a month later, something else uh, happened to sort of kick off the, the Trump campaign that went more under the radar. Uh, and I, di I didn't even remember this at the time, uh, although it came up during my research uh, for the book. This was a Twitter announcement, um, Twitter ad that you can see at the bottom there that this um, was tweeted in July, mid-July of 2015. So just like a month after 
Trump came down the escalator. And so there's, this doesn't look unusual. This looks kind of typical, kind of what you'd expect. Here's a candidate, you know, sort of uh, almost literally draping himself in the American flag. And you can see on the right there where those red stripes are, there's an image of, of money, presumably the economy, the White House, and then there are some soldiers, you know, so hitting, you know, some traditional themes, right? Well, what um, escaped, you know, uh, the notice of virtually everyone uh, was the fact that that in the bottom right corner there, those soldiers were not actually U.S. soldiers. In fact, uh, those were men who were dressed in uh, uniforms worn by the Nazi SS, in particular, the, the Waffen division of the SS. And so you may know that the SS was um, kind of the, the private or you know, security force of the Nazi party, known for being particularly ruthless, stamping out all opposition, um, you know, uh, dissenters uh, within the party and in, in Germany. And the uh, Waffen division of the SS was known for being particularly ruthless and, and violent. Now, these aren't actual, you know, uh, Nazi Waffen soldiers. These are men who are dressed up like Nazi Waffen soldiers for the purpose of some type of reenactment. But the point is, is that the uniforms are, you know, exactly, you know, historically accurate. And they're not U.S. military, um, for sure. Um, you know, quickly the Trump campaign, you know, so this got in the news. Uh, they said, oh, this was just a mistake. Uh, some intern did this and they took it down and that was that, right? Hardly anyone noticed. Um, by the way, it turns out that one of the most um, violent sort of current white supremacist groups, really a neo-Nazi type of white supremacist group, is a group called the Adam Waffen Division, uh, also known as the Nationalist, National Socialist Order. Uh, they are one of the most violent um, white supremacist groups that are around. Uh, it's not clear if, if they're uh, defunct now because they have been um, you know, hounded by law enforcement. Uh, but they do have, they've also spread their influence internationally. And just recently, I know there was a cell that was um, uh, uncovered in, in Russia of all places. But um, anyhow, um, strange little coincidence there. And then we started to see more of these, you know, coincidences perhaps, right? Um, or at least as they were claimed. Uh, you may remember this tweet. This received some attention. This was also in. Uh, this was actually right before the election, or in the election year, July of 2016, the summer before the election. Uh, this meme here uh, about Hillary Clinton, right? Um, and you might know. So that's that star. It looks like a star of David, and all the money in the background. Well, so this was cited as being, you know, sort of an, an anti-Semitic uh, meme. Now. Uh, in the Trump campaign said, oh, it's just a sheriff's star. It's not a star of David. Well, regardless of what you think about the star, uh, and if you think, well, it could or it couldn't be, I can at least tell you that that exact meme came from uh, a forum in which, you know, white nationalists and alt-right people uh, communicate and gather. And so, um, you, you know, we might consider the source at least. Uh, Trump has been known on more than one occasion to retweet tweets from known uh, alt-right or white nationalist figures. Uh, this Twitter handle, White Genocide TM, well, I don't know how anyone, you know, who uh, would be running for president maybe or their staff, especially when your staff has connections to the alt-right, wouldn't know that white genocide is kind of the rallying cry of um, you know, white nationalists. That's gonna come up um, a little bit later in the presentation. And so he has done that on more than one occasion. And that I don't think he's ever like acknowledged or apologized for. Uh, and of course, many of you would remember this during the campaign, um, David Duke, along with you know, actually many other white supremacists and white nationalist leaders, uh, openly endorsed Donald Trump uh, and expressed a, a strong preference for Donald Trump. David Duke even said, if you don't vote 
if you're white and you don't vote for Donald Trump, you're a traitor to your race. Uh, when Trump was confronted with that uh, endorsement, of course, he famously um, waffled, you know, on disavowing David Duke. You know, eventually he did, but he waffled just enough uh, so that, you know, it sent a signal, huge signal within the white nationalist community that this was just yet another nod uh, from Trump uh, that he was their candidate. And of course, there are um, many other examples as recently even in the 2020 debate when he um, told the Proud Boys to, to stand by, right? It seems like there've been many instances like this. So why did Trump do this? Was the strategy successful and preview uh, the answer uh, is yes. And why was it successful? And so those are the questions that I'm gonna focus on uh, here over the next several several minutes. So uh, uh, what Trump was trying to do, or at least what he was facilitating, was something we call the, the, the mainstreaming of, of the white nationalist movement and white racial extremists more generally. Um, we refer to mainstream as kind of a two-way street. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I think when there's, you know, um, kind of a conventional wisdom maybe, or at least interp one interpretation of, of sort of recent history is that Donald Trump was this, you know, racist, is this racist leader. And he got people worked up and basically, you know, he's responsible for, you know, this sort of white kind of racist backlash. Well, um, certainly, you know, that's true to some extent, but we also argue that, uh, and this is the two-way street part, is that, you know, for Trump to be successful, uh, there needed to be people in place who were susceptible uh, to his, you know, racialized appeals, right? Uh, and so uh, it's, I think it, it's just as much the case that Trump took advantage of a situation, an opportunity that was already there uh, and, and he may have uh, mobilized a constituency uh, or, you know, that was, or brought into his coalition a constituency that was already partly mobilized, actually, as I'll explain, uh, but it, that had been there, you know, uh, for quite a while. So, so we focus on two populations uh, that have become mainstreamed, uh, which I mentioned earlier. One uh, are these, you know, what we call the white racial extremists. Um, most of them previously inactive in politics. In other words, sort of just not participating at all. Uh, and then also um, white nationalists and white supremacist activists. Again, those who had been participating in the movement uh, in the form of a protest politics, fringe politics. Uh, and, and for both of these populations, I'm gonna explain uh, how and why they became mainstreamed. So to do that, and I'm gonna, um, take a little detour for a minute and just talk about this from kind of a social psychology perspective. And this is what we do in the book to try to understand, you know, how this happens and, and why it happens. And, and, and we refer to this as a, sort of a framework for understanding racially, what we call racially motivated political behavior. And here we're trying to explain the behavior, racially motivated behavior of whites. So uh, there's a large body of literature and psychology that has looked at this comes out of a, a tradition that's referred to as social identity theory that identifies two uh, important sort of sets of attitudes. Uh, one is referred to sometimes as in-group favoritism. Uh, in this case, specifically what we're interested in is um, a set of attitudes or an attitude we, that's called white racial identity. Uh, it's often measured uh, in surveys and in studies by asking people this question, how important is being white to your identity? Uh, and so strong racial identifiers uh, would answer that it's very important, right? So it, it, it turns out that if you identify strongly, uh, if you have strong sense of racial identity, uh, then it's, of course, it's more likely that you see the world in terms of sort of in-group, out-group terms. Uh, because you more likely identify and, and see yourself as belonging to one group. And then people who aren't in that group 
you know, they can they potentially get identified as um, members of, of what might be called outgroups. Now, um, outgroups um, are not necessarily viewed negatively, but there's a strong potential that they will be, uh, especially among people who have high levels of, of in-group identity. Uh, and when when that when outgroups uh, are viewed negatively, we refer to that as outgroup hostility. And when does that when is that most likely to happen? That's likely to happen uh, when uh, in-group members uh, perceive that the in-group is being threatened by the outgroup. And so, uh, so this is sort of the basic framework we work in, at least uh, in trying to understand uh, what's happened over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and so here, this is sort of a, uh, a figure, uh, kind of flow chart from the book to kind of sketch it out. Um, you'll notice there are the white racial identity there is in one box. So that's one set of attitudes, uh, but for, for to get converted to outgroup hostility, there, there need to be in place a couple of other uh, clusters of attitudes. One is a sense of group-based grievances, and this is related to that, that sense of threat. Um, and think, you know, I'm white, I, you know, strong identify as white, and I think whites are getting screwed because there are people coming over from other countries and taking our jobs who aren't white, okay? Um, that would be sort of a group-based grievance, uh, a grievance that you identify as originating from the fact that you're a member of, of the in-group. Uh, but what's also necessary is an attribution of blame. Who's to blame for this? Uh, you know, so, so um, this becomes politicized when uh, the political system, at least in part, uh, becomes the target of, of of blame, and obviously, you know, there would be blame placed on the the group that is the source of the threat. But also, uh, this becomes politicized when that is also tied to as it's facilitated by or caused by uh, at least part of or political elites uh, from the political system. When those three things happen, of course, we're going to see outgroup hostility, and uh, we're potentially also like to see it likely to see it manifest itself in sort of political action of some kind. So um, we spent some time look, you know, pouring through survey data and uh, we, we make an argument based on uh, a good bit of evidence that um, among you know, white identifiers, you know, those high in racial identity, white racial identity, uh, there are three sort of politically relevant racial outgroups. Uh, now we're folk, we, we, even though um, you might not think of uh, Latino immigrants and, and Muslims as racial groups, we argue that they've become racialized in many, in, in at least, a, you know, sort of a sociological sense. Uh, so it's these three groups, attitudes toward these three groups that are uh, the target uh, recently of increasing out group hostility. Um, by recently, I mean like since say the early 2000s. Um, and then uh, also these, it's attitudes toward these three groups that have become most politically relevant in determining who you vote for and whether you support Donald Trump or not. So we, in our data, and uh, I think this is really in, uh, important or at least interesting, is we actually define, you know, the question is, well, how many people, you know, are are these white racial extremists? Is it a large group, a small group? You know, what percentage? People always wanna know, you know, have us put a number on it. So in the book, uh, we, we tried to do that. Uh, we're able to measure these, these attitudes uh, using something called the racial resentment scale for attitudes toward African-Americans, uh, an anti-immigrant scale, um, and an anti-Muslim feeling thermometer. Now, a feeling thermometer is simply a question that asks you to uh, describe how warm or cold you feel toward a particular group. And if uh, the scale on that, it's like a thermometer, it ranges from zero to 100, and they ask the respondent, the survey does, to place the group somewhere on that thermometer. So a score of 100 would mean that's the maximum amount of warmth you could have toward that group. A value of zero would be the absolute minimum amount of warmth that you would have toward 
that group, extreme coldness. In the anti-immigrant scale, there's also a feeling thermometer score. So what we did is we looked at these scales and we identified whites who uh, indicated that, you know, responded in a way that reflected the most extreme hostility toward at least one of the three groups. So that means for Muslims, you would have had to have uh, responded with a zero uh, if that was the group that you had maximum hostility toward. Uh, for the racial resentment scale, that's a 16 point scale based on four different survey items. You would have to, to be in, identified as a white racial extremist, you would have to respond in each of the four items in the most negative way for every single one of them. Similar situation for the anti-immigrant scale. So the point of telling you all this is just to say, it's, it's not easy to get counted as a white racial extremist using our methodology in, this, in these surveys. And we, use, we do this with more than one survey, by the way. Um, and actually, you know, we wanted to construct it in a way that if there was any bias, uh, we're under-reporting the number of white racial extremists. And the other thing I would just mention too, is that if there's any bias in responding, people are generally going to under-report uh, their degree of, of prejudice or hostility toward a group. So we think that these are probably, you know, pretty reasonable estimates of this concept of white racial extremists. But, you know, admittedly, uh, someone could do something a little bit different. I'm not aware that anyone's ever done anything like this. Um, all right, so a couple things, I'll, I'm gonna show you the numbers. One thing we've noticed um, is that attitudes toward African-Americans, uh, Latinx immigrants and Muslims have become more strongly correlated over time. Meaning that if you know uh, that, that, you know, attitudes toward these groups are more interconnected. Uh, if you're hostile toward one group, you're more likely to be hostile to one of the other two groups. You can see, and uh, we've tracked this over four different presidential election years, and you can see uh, beginning in 2008, uh, it started to increase through uh, 2016, where that intercorrelation there among the three sets of scales is, is pretty strong. Uh, we've argued that this is for, you know, this outgroup hostility now that really is um, fundamentally about attitudes toward these three groups is sort of a new racial ideology, even in, in the, due to the fact that the attitudes are connected. So here's the data on uh, prevalence of white racial extremists, okay? Um, I should also mention that we identify uh, another group that we refer to as racial conservatives. These are people who, while uh, they're not counted as a racial extremist uh, on these three scales, uh, they come in as uh, more hostile than the midpoint of the scale for each of the three groups. The racial extremists have the maximum amount of hostility toward at least one group, but they also have to have above the midpoint hostility scores for the other two groups. So overall, all whites, this comes from the 2016 um, American National Election Study, 13% uh, of whites were classified as racial extremists. Uh, another 10% roughly racial conservatives. So about 23% of whites were um, classified as either racially conservative or extremist. Now we go to Trump voters. Uh, about 21 per 22%, that's what, more than one in five were classified as racial extremists based on our measure compared to 1% of, of Clinton voters. If you combine that with, uh, for Trump voters with the percent racial conservatives, we're about at 38% of Trump voters. And there you can also see that it's higher for white men compared to white women. Uh, and as you'd expect, um, it's higher for whites with less than a college education and uh, lower for whites with a bachelor's degree or, or graduate degree, that not surprising. But now uh, there, we have a number um, that we can put on it. Uh, it's not the majority of Trump voters, um, but given how we measure, especially the racial extremist uh, whites, um, I would think 22%, maybe that's a number, maybe about what you figured, but now, if it is, you've got some empirical uh, data to actually 
um, help justify that. Okay, so um, so that's white racial extremists. That's basically at, you know all whites in 2016, um, and they were of course a target for mainstreaming and have been um, for like the last 10 years. Uh, but especially by Donald Trump. But, we, but we've also seen a mainstreaming and, and, a, and a targeting by political elites of, of white members of the white nationalist movement, participants in the white nationalist movement. Uh, of course, you know, far fewer in number, but, uh, you know, very politically relevant for, uh, you know, uh, and concerning for a variety of reasons. So I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes just sort of defining, uh, telling you a little bit about that movement. Uh, so what do we mean by white nationalists? Well, uh, there are many different groups. It's, it's actually a fairly diverse set of groups. What unites them is that uh, what gets them to be labeled white nationalists in our data is that they are united by a sense of a threatened white racial identity. They, they view the world and the United States uh, as you know, white Anglo-Saxons, Christians sit atop a racial hierarchy, and they believe for one reason or another, for various reasons, that uh, their position in that hierarchy is, is threatened. Um, now we further, you know, sort of subdivide, um, you know, white nationalist groups into two different categories. And so some we refer to as white supremacist groups. And uh, those are actually the categories there um, of white supremacist groups, which, you know, those, uh, those names, those labels you, you may recognize. Um, and we do this because these are the groups that have a more explicit um, ideology that, you know, whites are superior in some way. Sometimes it's a cultural uh, argument that they make. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it tends toward a more sort of inherent biological definition, but, but the cultural, um, you know, superiority you know, argument is one that's pretty common these days. But there are many white, you know, nationalist groups that won't go as far to, to make that claim and they'll justify what they do and what they believe in based on simply, we just want the same rights as, you know, non-white groups. And they feel that they're being persecuted. Uh, we just want to feel uh, proud about our heritage, just like other groups get to feel proud about their heritage. And so they're not as upfront about it. Um, perhaps, um, you know, I, we could quibble, you know, where to draw the line. We could call them all white supremacist groups as far as I'm concerned, but I think it's a useful distinction, at least in terms of how they present themselves. Um, many of the groups that we would label now alt-right would fit into this other white nationalist uh, sort of group category. So one, one thing I, I should point out or, or just clarify is that um, when we think, talk about the extreme right, you know, fringe right, uh, white nationalist groups are not the only sort of groups that uh, exist on the extreme right. They're also as a you know, sort of a separate category, at least separate in terms, you know, as identified by the people like me who study these groups. Um, another category that we refer to sometimes as uh, the militia movement, um, the Southern Poverty Law Center refers to them as the anti-government patriot movement. Um, and there's an overlap there. Uh, oftentimes I think the two get sort of, uh, you know, considered to be kind of one and the same. There's, there's overlap, there might even be more overlap than I've actually indicated there in, in, on the slide. Uh, and I would say, you know, what separates them is that, you know, white nationalist groups are first and foremost about white uh, preserving, you know, white supremacy, white identity, the threatened, uh, you know, position of whites and um, to some extent or another are obviously uh, exhibit outgroup hostility. The anti-government militia groups that we've been hearing more about recently, especially, um, many of them uh, actually have, you know, the same or similar types of uh, views on race. They tend to be, you know, overwhelmingly white. Uh, and in fact, um, there, there is a bit of mingling and sort of traveling across the two sets of groups. But what makes them different is that, 
for many of them, you won't find any kind of you know racial rhetoric or uh, anti you know outgroup rhetoric or white identity rhetoric in in their platforms. Their bigger priority is the government. Uh, they're more like you know they they both sets of groups are likely to subscribe to various kinds of conspiracy theories, but um, the anti the Militia movement people, patriot movement people, are the ones that are going to be more likely to be spouting things about a you know uh, new world order, kind of a global conspiracy, um, you know that sort of thing, and also that that Jews are you know part of this sort of international elite cabal that you know uh, are going to be creating um, you know sort of a one world government stuff like that. Um, they're often violent. Uh, and as, as you know, not all of them um, necessarily, but the, the ones that would really fall into the militia movement category, they're the ones that are out there with, with their weapons. Many of them are recruited from law enforcement or from you know, their ex-military, and they're out there shooting their guns and practicing, and uh, they're ready. They're ready for the revolution. Um, real quickly, just, you know, the Klan, a uh, variety of clans, organizations uh, still out there. Uh, some of them still dress in the traditional kind of robes. Um, some don't. Uh, it just varies. Um, of course, there are neo-Nazi groups. What sort of sets them apart is the fact that they tend to, you know, dress up in sort of Nazi uh, sort of style clothing and use Nazi symbols and of course kind of worship Adolf Hitler. Um, so a lot of the Nazi culture is reflected in, in what they do as well as their ideology. Um, one, you know, very, um, you know, I uh, hate to use the word important, significant uh, neo-Nazi leader uh, was a man named William Pierce. And William Pierce uh, was the sort of leader uh, of the National Alliance. You can see the similarity in the symbol there that he's standing next to. Uh, one thing that William Pierce is known for is he wrote uh, a couple of books, uh, fiction books. One of them was called The Turner Diaries. And this was uh, The Turner Diaries written back in the, um, you know, 1980s, uh, early 80s, I, I believe. And uh, it, uh, you know, you can see the picture there on it. It tells a story of kind of a, a revolution uh, fight against the government, you know, um, kind of race war uh, fight against the, the government, white people fighting to, you know, save themselves. And uh, that book turned out to be the inspiration. That's Timothy McVeigh down there on the bottom left. Um, he was responsible for the Oklahoma City bombing, which is there in the bottom right. Uh, of course, which killed many, many people. Um, Timothy McVeigh was not in, he was inspired by the Turner Diaries, but he was not involved in a white supremacist or white nationalist group. Uh, the, his affiliation was with a militia group, the Michigan militia actually, which is also still, you know, getting in the news because of uh, the things they're doing up there in Michigan, including, you know, plotting to kidnap their, their governor as we saw earlier uh, or last year. Anyhow, uh, William uh, Pierce was actually on 60 Minutes in 1996, and uh, he was asked about the Oklahoma City bombing and, he, and asked if he approved. And he told Mike Wallace, no, I don't. I've said that over and over again. I don't approve of the Oklahoma City bombing because the United States is not yet in a revolutionary situation. And he told uh, the Washington Post, Around the same time, the Oklahoma City bombing didn't make sense politically. Terrorism only makes sense if it can be sustained over a period of time. One day there will be real organized terrorism done according to plan aimed at bringing down the government. So I, I mentioned that just because here's a, you know, lead, was a leading figure, he's dead now, of the, uh, the white supremacist movement but obviously a very strong you know, anti-government sentiment. Um, and so the anti-government sentiment is there within the white nationalist movement as well, mostly in the most extreme uh, uh, organizations, but not, it's not as widespread, nor is it like a defining feature as it is for the uh, anti-government 
militia movement people. Uh, of course, we, you know, there are skinheads who are sort of, uh, sort of like the, you know, youth branch of the sort of neo-Nazi movement. Um, and then Christian identity groups, which obviously, you know, um, is rooted in an interpretation of, of the Bible. They've always been smaller in number, but they have a very radical ideology uh, that has, um, uh, I think, spread to other, other groups, even though they don't, uh, operate as a, you know, religious group. And they've also influenced uh, some of these lone wolf um, attackers, terrorists, um, uh, in over the years. Uh, and then the, those, those, are the, those are the white supremacist groups. The other white nationalist groups, it's a hodgepodge of groups. You can see there in the upper left, that's David Duke. Um, you know, he's bounced around from one uh, group to another for a while there. He was heading up uh, after he left the Klan, the National Association for the Advancement of White People. Um, there's a you know, group called the Council of Conservative Citizens, um, you know, groups that kind of like we would consider these alt-right groups, they're, they're kind of not, not as explicit um, about their racism. Uh, they dress it up a little bit more, there's a little bit softer tone, they, you know, they look different, uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's not that different. And I mentioned Stormfront here, which is actually a website. Uh, that's one of the oldest sort of forums for, um, for white nationalists to gather and communicate online. And uh, we spent a good bit of time reading through all these posts going back many years uh, to sort of gather you know, information and, uh, and you know, some perspective from the movement members about what was happening to them. Uh, I, I want to mention uh, this other category of group called, which is a white nationalist, uh, other white nationalist group that are called neo-confederate groups. This one in particular is the largest one. It's called the League of the South. And uh, they exist most, mostly in the South, as you might guess. Um, they, uh, I believe, were formed in the 1990s, um, maybe late 80s. Uh, the, they're uh, the founding sort of leader, Michael Hill, is pictured there. He's still alive. They're still around. Their headquarters is in Killen, Alabama. There you can see that, you know, their, their platform, you know, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, trying to recreate the Confederacy. Uh, but they've been known to be explicitly uh, racist as well. There's a picture of Michael Hill uh, from back in the, uh, maybe that's the mid-90s. Uh, this is actually an article if you want to read uh, it's not very long it talks about um, how the league of the south was created michael hill got is a uh, history professor he got his phd uh, one floor down from me here in the ten whore building at the university of alabama in the history department and believe it or not it's a weird story uh, he taught history at stillman college for uh, a a period of time. So that's him standing in, in front, of course, the uh, university club here in, in Tuscaloosa. So um, yeah, uh, that's bizarre. Um, so there are many types of uh, kind of threat narratives that we identified from sort of combing through, you know, white nationalist websites. They, most of these groups have kind of a platform uh, or some type of manifesto. And you know, we, we found and sort of categorized these different threat narratives. Uh, of course, one of the most common is the demographic threat narrative. Um, this idea that the white race is you know, on the verge of extinction uh, and that to some degree it's sort of deliberate uh, and malicious on behalf of the government and uh, due to its promotion of you know, pro-diversity kinds of policies. Um, there's a uh, cultural threat narrative that is, you know, part of this uh, shrinking uh, and, you know, looming extinction of the white race is also a dismantling of kind of white, you know, Western culture. Uh, there's certainly an economic threat uh, narrative that's pretty common. Um, you hear it more these days with respect to, you know, Latin American immigrants and Mexican immigrants, but you still see it. Uh, with respect to African Americans. Um, there's a security threat narrative, of course, uh, for uh, Blacks in this country. It, it often has to do with, you know, narratives about crime and, um, 
and the threat, you know, security threat to whites um, from, from black crime. You also, of course, see it uh, as well um, with respect to Latinx immigrants and, uh, you know, just sometimes, you know, made up numbers, sometimes they might come from somewhere, but they're certainly distorted in some way or another. And then there is, you know, there's a political narrative too, of course, and that's what causes, you know, this ideology to become politicized too, is that um, these threats are happening, uh, you know, at the hands of, or at least our government is, is complicit with it. And so uh, you can see, there that, um, you know, I think one of the things that accelerated this, of course, was the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And then eventually in the 80s and 90s, uh, more and more, uh, you know, uh, successful uh, candidates of color being elected to office. So here is a sort of a picture of where uh, the, we find uh, these white nationalist groups most concentrated geographically. Um, this is sort of per capita. Um, I mean, you know, New York, California might have the most in Florida in terms of the total number of white nationalist groups. But if we look at this per capita, you can see that the, you know, the South, you know, obviously scores high. Uh, but also you see up there in the sort of the upper left and the um, sort of West, upper Midwest there, um, increasingly there's been migration actually of white nationalists to these places uh, because these are mostly all white places. Uh, okay, so are we in the midst of a racial backlash? Um, so it turns out yes and no, uh, depends how you look at it. If we're talking about an attitudinal backlash, um, in other words, have racial as outgroup hostility increased over time? Um, in the most recent years, no, it's actually decreased, uh, but Whoops, sorry. There has been a what we call a behavioral backlash. Uh, that is, those who um, hold you know high levels of outgroup hostility are more likely to be acting on it politically. That's what we find, and um, that's kind of I think the main sort of conclusion, or one of the big conclusions, is that what's happened is um, you know this mainstreaming has been more about mobilization to action uh, and, uh, and a movement of, you know, the, the target of that action from the fringe to the, the mainstream and less of an attitudinal backlash in the sense of changing racial attitudes themselves. Uh, if anything, attitudes uh, have been changing more in the opposite direction. And so I'll show you this because we're able, you know, we're able to measure, um, identify, you know, measure racial extremists and conservatives over time there was an increase certainly from 2004 to 2012. And that's really important because that's what sort of um, got these groups mobilized uh, politically more so than ever. And of course that was a result of the election of, of Barack Obama. That was a huge tipping point. Uh, but kind of surprisingly from 2012 to 2016, uh, they actually decreased in number, but they're more politically active. So that's kind of the, you know, uh, something you wouldn't, you know, necessarily realize if you're just watching the news. Um, and here is just, you know, some more evidence that these specific outgroup hostility attitudes toward, you know, all three groups, as well as sort of a scale that combines attitudes toward all three groups, all increased uh, more or less in tandem. Uh, through 2012, but all have decreased since. Now, um, the de decrease hasn't been uniform. Uh, as we can see here, when we sort it out by political party, it turns out that um, there's, there has been a slight decrease among Republicans, but not nearly as, as much as we see among Democrats. And so this, this sort of movement toward um, you know, what we sometimes refer to as, you know, racial uh, progressives, more racial progressive outgroup warmth uh, has been largely driven by, you know, the left. Little bit among Republicans, but you can see even by 2016, Republicans were at a higher level of outgroup hostility than they were in 2004. So the final 
sort of piece of the puzzle is, is what happens, how does, you know, what happens when outgroup hostility is activated uh, and how does that get translated into different types of political action? And so uh, the mechanism we argue is anger. Um, and that's certainly something, you know, we've seen more of and, and uh, then that anger, we argue it forms kind of a political energy and then that energy is expressed in one of three ways. Either um, you know, people don't participate at all in politics and they just sort of sit home and, and stew about it. Uh, they engage in protest politics or they uh, engage in conventional kind of electoral politics. And so the mainstreaming that, uh, uh, of the white nationalist movement and the white racial extremists is basically basically been one of moving from alienation and protest politics to conventional politics. Um, this is just some, documenting the increase in anger as a result of, of uh, the election of Obama, especially among um, white racial extremists and conservatives. And after Obama is elected, George W. Bush uh, makes a very gracious statement uh, about uh, Obama's election. Uh, and I think this was kind of the low point uh, for racial white racial extremists in this country, uh, because for them, at least in terms of conventional politics as a, as a solution, uh, because here it's clear, you know, the Republican Party wants nothing to do with them, really, at least, you know, for the most part. And of course, the Democrats don't. Uh, and so where does that leave them as an option, either to just sit on the sidelines, which, you know, most of them did, but, um, or to, to you know, be active in um, white nationalist movement organizations. And so uh, conventional politics, at least you know, in the early years after Obama was elected, uh, was sort of ruled out for them. And what we saw was less participation in politics, uh, conventional politics, and an increase in protest politics. I'm gonna skip over some slides just so I can get uh, to the last part about the campus relevance here. Um, actually, when Obama was elected, white nationalist leaders were, and so, some of them expressed, you know, some glee, uh, delight in the fact that this would, you know, make it easier for them to recruit members to their extremist organizations. And indeed, that's, that is what happened. Uh, but then, um, you know, in the middle of Obama's first term, we had the Tea Party movement. The Tea Party movement, we argue, served as the bridge uh, important bridge from the fridge, fringe to the mainstream. White nationalist groups, um, you know, started to talk about entering into mainstream politics, you know, and, uh, just like, you know, um, out, these outgroup candidates have been able to be successful, you know, whites need to fight back and uh, beat them at their own game. Um, big, you know, big debate about tactics, whether that's the right thing to do, the wrong thing to do, but, um, many of them saw the Tea Party movement as that vehicle for them. And so this debate and tactics has been going on for a long time. David Duke was, you know, long been an advocate for ditching the Klan robe and putting on the suit and tie and, and trying to run for office and taking his explicit white nationalist ideology to, you know, um, to the electorate. He did win a term in the Louisiana House of Representatives, uh, but his bids for, you know, governor, U.S. Senate, and uh, presidency, of course, were uh, very um, unsuccessful. But we found lots of evidence uh, in the chatter on Stormfront um, that the Tea Party was seen as a vehicle, uh, a plausible vehicle for white supremacist organizations to uh, sort of move into as a way to achieve at least some of their goals and to have some success. Um, in this quote from an anonymous poster, simply complaining about the fact that they're looked at as wacko extremists and that, you know, somehow they're going to have to, you know, create a better image and if they want to have some meaningful change. Um, in fact, some of them actually created a coalition called the Tea Party Americans Coalition. And um, you can see here from this quote from a uh, post on Stormfront is that, um, you know, they argue to be a valuable tool to further the agenda of white nationalism um, and, you know, sort of hiding behind, you know, this Tea Party label, which is, you know, more acceptable. 
Um, there, we also started to see, you know, uh, political candidates sort of rise up uh, under white nationalist platforms. One of them that's still around is called the American Freedom Party. It formed in 2010 uh, as the American Third Position Party, uh, aligned itself with the Tea Party, but also, you know, of course, is, it, it has run its own candidates. Um, what eventually happened, uh, the Tea Party movement, which started out as a, a movement about sort of fiscal conservatism and anti-tax movement, kind of quickly became dominated by sort of uh, outgroup hostility. Um, Tea Party supporters, you know, in surveys uh, were identified as having, you know, the, the highest level of um, you know, racial hostility. And it was very evident at, you know, Tea Party rallies where you saw explicitly racist signs time and time again, um, many of them, you know, focusing, uh, targeting Barack Obama. And of course, we, we have the rise of the alt-right related to all of this. The alt-right is just a label. Um, you know, old wine and new bottles. Um, I don't make too much of that term. Don't use it a lot. Um, people who were previously, you know, labeled as white nationalists or white supremacists, you know, now get labeled as alt-right. It's an explicit strategy to try to create a softer, more acceptable image. Yeah, if you've heard of Richard Spencer, he was the one who coined the term. Uh, you know, so uh, he's very explicit, you know, white supremacist. Uh, but has created, he's Duke educated, created something called the National Policy Institute in Washington. He's uh, the one who was uh, leading the cheers after Trump was elected, where, you know, he said, hail Trump, and they all, you know, um, raised their hand in the Nazi salute. Of course, he was uh, involved in the Unite the Right rally in, in Charlottesville. And, um, you know, his, his strategy has been, um, really to try to make his ideas, uh, white nationalism more acceptable and more mainstream. And it, you know, it's, it's kind of based on something called the Overton window, which um, I can come back to if, if someone uh, want to talk about that. It's an idea that if you simply, you know, uh, make known more extreme views uh, that eventually if you do it, uh, long enough and frequently enough in forums that are mainstream forums, those views will event, people will get used to it. And eventually those views will um, fall into the, the Overton window of acceptability is basically how that argument goes. And in an interview uh, with the Atlantic, Spencer actually uh, used the example of gay marriage. And I think very you know, uh, astutely that you know this was a radical idea at one point, um, and but uh, pro LGBT groups, um, gay rights groups promoted this idea, even though it was extreme at the time, and eventually it caught on, and now it's you would even say popular. That is that's his goal. What he says is that uh, that's what the alt right is doing. It's thinking those political ideas that aren't possible yet, and imagining a reality in which they are. That's the purpose of bringing them into electoral politics. So one place where the, you know, the battleground has been, um, uh, or where these battles are being fought, of course, uh, and, and where um, you know, alt-right and white nationalist groups you know, are, are targeting their efforts is college campuses. And this will be the last part of my presentation. I'll wrap it up so we can have some discussion. And obviously this is where your jobs um, you know, are, are really important. And I'm sure many of you have experiences with this. One of the most prominent alt-right white nationalists, Jared Taylor, uh, was invited to campus um, in, in 2018 by a University of Alabama student group, Students for America First. I should say America First, not American. Um, at the time, I, I had a student um, who was one of my advisees, just one of our majors, who was one of the founding members of this group. It sounded to me like it was just some pro-Trump group, but um, this was prior to they, when they invited Jared Taylor. Uh, but I decided to go look them up on um, uh, Twitter, and it, I found, you know, I was able to find that they were const you know, constantly retweeting tweets from known kind of alt-right sources and, and figures and also, you know, 
kind of white nationalist narratives. And then this came out that they had invited Jared Taylor. Um, of course, what it created, you know, those of you from UA or maybe around the state who, you know, uh, remember this, it, there was uh, a lot of concern about this. Fortunately, um, the group lost its uh, sort of official campus organization status because their faculty advisor quit and no one else would volunteer to, to be their faculty advisor. And so the visit got canceled, but there was a lot of uh, activity and talk uh, discussion about what to do about it. Um, I would also you know, say this is not uh, uncommon. Campuses are getting targeted all the time. This is the webpage for the American Freedom Party, which I mentioned a minute ago. You can see there in the picture, you know, diversity equals white genocide. You can see the hashtag white genocide. Again, that's the most popular, you know, kind of uh, rallying cry and, and hashtag for the movement on Twitter. So on their website, they uh, have a section where they have, they call it the Speakers Bureau, and they have a, a list of different speakers and they, they invite you to request for a speaker to come to your, uh, you know, come speak to your group or your campus, especially. And uh, many of them, or several of them, are recognizable white nationalist figures. Uh, he, you can also request specific subjects that they will come talk about. And I just took screenshots. Uh, you actually scroll through, it's a pretty long list. I took screenshots to get at least a bunch of them in there. Whoops. So you can see uh, some of them more explicitly racist than, than others. Uh, one of their uh, board members actually contacted me back in 2011, shortly after I arrived at the University of Alabama. It's a guy named Tom Sunick. He actually has a PhD in political science. And um, I had no idea who he was. I didn't know who the American Freedom Party was. And he contacted me. Um, and just fortunately, you know, I, I ran it by uh, one of our, my colleagues sounded like, you know, guys pretty qualified. Fortunately, um, I just happened to start doing some research uh, on the American Freedom Party back then it was American Third Position Party and discovered I said, him on their board. And I said, that name sounds familiar. And it turns out it's this guy. Um, and so that was, uh, I mean, we very easily could have brought him to, to campus and not known. Um, and so, yeah, for that taught me a lesson. Every single speaker, you need to vet them and make sure that um, they're not problematic in, in, in this way. Um, since the 2016 election, we've also seen you know, lots of recruiting going on, uh, targeting college groups. We had our group here, Students for American First. Auburn has you know, white student union, or at least they used to. Um, here are some posters from around campus. The American or uh, Anti-Defamation League tracks this. You can go to their website if you want to get more information, but you can see that they've um, identified at least 122 different campuses in 33 states just in one semester alone, uh, spring 2019. And um, much of it comes from a group called the American Identity Movement. There's also the Patriot Front. You can Google them and, and learn more about them. And not all of them, you know, you would know are, are you know, alt-right or white nationalist groups. They really do um, try to, you know, uh, disguise uh, their mission uh, sometimes. Um, so I'm going to stop here um, and because I want to make sure we get some questions in. I know I went a little bit over time. And, but I will say just to sort of uh, summarize the, you know, the rest of the book, uh, we show that, you know, white racial extremists, white nationalists, you know, worked uh, on behalf of the Trump campaign and were actually now, you know, been absorbed into electoral politics and in within the Republican Party. Um, obviously, you know, that is no surprise, you know, to you, I'm sure, because we've seen it time and time again, you know, on television, evidence of that. Um, and I think this is quite problematic for our politics going forward. And I'll leave it at, at that and love to take any questions. Wow. Let me say it again. Wow. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fording. I, I really appreciate your presentation. And I'm going to start with my own question. And again, remind uh, those that are participating, please put your questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to use a cooking metaphor. Um, with respect to the presence uh, and energy around these extreme groups, would you say that we're on a simmer, a slow boil, or a rapid boil? Um, well, I think we're coming off a rapid boil and we might be on a simmer right now. Um, there's been a lot of activity during the pandemic um, as some of these groups, you know, and it's known, it's been, you know, like verified in like chats uh, on different platforms that these groups trying to take advantage of the pandemic um, to recruit people, you know, they're all, these groups are always trying to do that. And so they took the, um, you know, sort of the pandemic you know, government mandates, you know, the health mandates, the mask mandates, right? Uh, and they've sort of tried to make that into an issue. And it, it, it kind of worked. It became politicized. Trump jumped on it after there were protests outside of state capitals way back in the, you know, uh, spring. And, um, and of course, then we had, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests, which sparked all kinds of um, you know, activity, uh, counter mobilization within the, you know, sort of white nationalist and militia community as well, much of which we've seen on TV with clashes, right? Um, and then, of course, this, you know, the stop the steal, the, uh, you know, uh, election uh, baloney, right? Uh, and then, of course, what happened at the Capitol. So I think that was the boil. Um, I think right now we're on a simmer, but, um, a lot will depend on what Donald Trump does too, I think. All right, Dr. Fording, can I ask you to, uh, to come out of your screen, out of your presentation mode? Absolutely. Okay, great. And, and I've got another question that came in. Uh, one of the folks in the audience said um, that uh, a lot of the information was similar to what she's read by the work of Carol Anderson. And she wrote, when we think about the January 6th insurrection, um, that was in full effect. Her question is, from your research, do you believe that there's a desire uh, among Caucasians to make a change, to move away from this sort of behavior? Move away? Um, yes, I think we're, you know, watching it play out um, probably right now on television, you know, during the impeachment mm -hmm. trial. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of Republicans um, certainly Democrats, but a lot of Republicans and independents and who are turned off by this. Um, one of the things that we documented in our book and then another article we just published that there has been a backlash against this racism uh, and it's pushed a lot of people to the left mm -hmm. to be what we call uh, racial progressives. Mm -hmm. And that was the number one factor that uh, mobilized the left uh, during the 2018 midterm elections, the blue wave. Mm -hmm. and we document that in the book. And then we also speculate that that energy is, that's going to continue. And um, the prospects would be good for Democrats. But, you know, we argued that, um, you know, some people argue, you know, stay away from race, you know, talk about class, try to appeal to working class whites through class issues. And we argued that um, you're not going to convert. Um, you know, sort of the, these hardcore people, these, these white racial extremist types. And uh, what we should instead be doing as a strategy is to simply expose them and to try to mobilize people in opposition. And I think that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, is that there are enough of them, of the, the white racial extremist types and racial conservatives to play an important role in, um, the Republican coalition now, which is really the Trump coalition, that as we know, too many Republicans are afraid, leaders are afraid to try to distance themselves from Trump, even though they, in this movement, even though they probably would want to. Mm 
Mm -hmm. All right. One, one of our other participants asked, is there a difference in national socialist groups and the socialist movement often seen supported on the farther left in terms of goals or economic structure? Yes, there is definitely uh, a difference. Uh, they call themselves national socialists and some of them you know, would like to see maybe more government ownership of some things, but don't be fooled by that label. There's nothing socialist and certainly nothing democratic about them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So one person asked, do you recall again what year the faculty, the person that got the PhD taught at Stillman that you spoke about earlier in your presentation? It would be in that article. Okay, in the article that you referenced. Yeah. Yeah, um, but they mentioned that it was like, you know, it was more than just like a year or two. It was like several years even. Okay. Um, and I've read, a, you can read about this elsewhere. It's sort of mentioned in his Michael Hill's profile on the Southern Poverty Law Center's website. All right. Um, about how he used to like wax nostalgic about the days of the Confederacy at Stillman. And, um, but that he was, you know, people didn't, think of him as like a big racist supposedly and and they didn't know about this other side to him and that he was I don't know if he's popular but he wasn't unpopular you know wow. it's, a, it's a weird story if, uh, but that uh, League of the South if you want to read about them of course because they're more active in the South was started by a group of history professors and um, mm. one of them did have ties um, one of our history professors did have ties with that group. And obviously his PhD student, uh, Michael Hill was the one who started it. So it's an unfortunate connection um, to this group that we have here. Okay, all right. Um, is it a waste of time to suggest that white supremacy, white nationalists with the predominance of white power, economic, political, and social as a systematic structure that continues to work to subjugate and oppress non-white groups. Is it, is it a waste of time to get into, even to get into the conversation in terms of how people see issues? Is it a waste of time to point that out? Yes. Um, depends who you're talking to. Um, you know, if, if there are, if, if you're talking to people who we would identify in the surveys as white racial conservatives and certainly these white racial extremists, um, you're wasting your time. But um, anyone else, um, especially anyone who I identify sort of in the political middle, but especially the, the left is already convinced of that. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think people in the middle um, are willing to hear that and, and, and they have heard it. And I, I think we've seen a shift in our politics. Um, we're not you know, all the way there yet, but look, Georgia went blue. Georgia elected two Democratic senators and elected Joe Biden. Um, right. So even in, you know, it, it will happen eventually. Um, the prospects for, you know, uh, you know, Trump strategy are not good. It's a short term strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, time is not on their side. And most Republicans realize that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, the election of President Obama. And, and one of our uh, participants asked, do you believe, what do you believe is the reason that Obama's election sparked such pushback with respect to racism? He was elected by whites and blacks, but the person argues they believe it was mostly uh, Caucasians. How does his election as an African-American, the first African-American president play into the narrative and the behavior that you've been able to identify in, in your body of work? So, what we argue, and I think what a lot of the research has shown, is that um, you know uh, it's these threat narratives that have caused um, you know white racial identity to become uh, converted to outgroup hostility and and then become politicized, uh, lead to anger. And uh, so many of these threat narratives uh, are rooted in uh, people of color threatening whites, and uh, also that being facilitated by the government, uh, which is what brings them into, into politics and leads them to be angry uh, about the government. But when the government is actually headed by a person of color, then it's even, I think, more obvious. Uh, 
um, these narratives uh, resonate more deeply. Uh, these frames, um, uh, there's a term we use called frame resonance. Uh, we did see increases uh, in immigration in the United States. That makes these, you know, sort of uh, threat narratives um, about uh, Latino immigrants resonate more. And, um, you know, when you start to see visible signs like this is why David Duke said uh, the election of Barack Obama was going to be the sort of the best visual aid we've ever had to recruit. Um, that unfortunately ended up being true. Right. One of our uh, participants introduces a new, a new phrase. They said, I recently read an article about acceleration. How prevalent is this theory that of causing chaos to recruit more supporters across extremist groups? That, yeah, it, it is a, uh, I've, I've been seeing it mentioned uh, on the chat boards that I follow. Um, and, you know, the white supremacist, white nationalist, uh, in the white nationalist communities. Uh, and so, you know, they believe that what they want ultimately, I uh, believe what's gonna happen is there is gonna be sort of a race war. And mm. that's what many of them were, you know, getting almost kind of excited during the George Floyd protests because, and wanted to get out there because they thought that it was starting to happen. And so, um, but many of them believe that the only way we're going to get there, you know, so they're, they're constant, white nationalists are constantly frustrated by the fact that most whites don't develop, you know, their kind of white racial consciousness. And so that's what they're trying to achieve. And, and some of them think it just has to get like so bad before they're going to wake up, you know, and so that's the, the accelerationist kind of uh, strategy is that, you know, maybe having someone like Barack Obama as president or, you know, having the government go too far in the other direction is going to be what it takes to sort of accelerate us toward that, that race war that they want. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question came in asking, uh, what do you think are the factors that contribute to what we believe are, or many of us believe are um, the Republican, currently elected Republican Republicans and their fear of Trump? How does this all play in? The fact, why are Republicans so afraid? Yes. Well, yes. Um, I, I didn't uh, get to it in the presentation. I just sort of briefly mentioned it at the end, but in the book, uh, we're able to document the fact that especially in the swing states, um, the, the white racial extremists, the, the groups with the highest levels of, of whites with the highest level of outgroup hostility, became mobilized in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, again, and disproportionately so in the, uh, the swing states. And of course, that was the result in part of uh, also the Trump campaign just pouring all kinds of uh, targeted social media ads, you know, in 2016 through the, especially through Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're mobilized and uh, they're a non-trivial uh, percentage of the Republican base. Now, in some states, it's smaller, and but in other states, it's larger. In a state like Alabama, it's going to be a larger percentage. That national percentage I showed you, which is like, like 22 percent, I think, um, being of Trump supporters being classified as white racial extremists, um, that's a national figure. So you know, you got to figure in a state like Alabama, other you know, uh, some other states is going to be higher than that even, and. Elections are so close now uh, in many places that, you know, politicians you never want to do anything to sacrifice votes if they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the participants says that they really appreciated um, your classification of group. They found it very informative. So where does QAnon fit in this topology that you shared with us earlier? So QAnon, um, it's obviously a real thing. Um, I don't think it's, it's something that's going to last. Um, it might already be kind of died out. It's more of an ideology um, than it is like a group, because at least that's my impression, because, you know, I, in my reading, uh, and I continue to read, um, I know most people would say, well, how can you do that? You know, read these, these uh, chat boards mm -hmm. to keep up with, especially during, you know, um, the last month, you know, and uh, 
surrounding all the stuff that was going in Washington. Uh, and there, you know, the white national, there are many white nationalists who also subscribe to the sort of QAnon kind of conspiracy theory. So it, it overlaps a lot with these, with these groups. It's sort of a, it's a ideology or a strand of, of um, conspiracy theory that just worked its way into kind of the thinking of um, both the militia groups and the white nationalist groups. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you, you know, it was just unbelievable to read these discussions. And uh, the day before the inauguration, um, there were people who, I mean, they believed that Joe Biden was going to get arrested and that Trump was going to come back in. Wow. Uh, and, um, you know, and that they even had like maps drawn, like here's Trump, here's where Pence is, they're poised to be ready to come back in. And um, they, and people would say things like, trust the plan, trust the plan, you know, because that's what Q was, you know, telling them uh, that this was all gonna work out. And um, so a lot of them are disillusioned right now. That's why I think it's a simmer. Right. Because many of them feel that they were let down. And I think they're just kind of, um, right now, uh, like, you know, simmering is a good metaphor and waiting to see what Trump's gonna do. A lot of them have disavowed Trump. I think we might see a lot of them go back to the fringe. We might see a spike in the number of um, like white nationalist movement groups mm -hmm. as they sort of now leave the Republican party politics because they're so disillusioned. A um, mm -hmm. lot left to be determined. So I want to shift gears a bit now and, and ask, seek your guidance on what we can do, those of us who are practitioners at the front line of our campuses. We, we all want our campuses to be inclusive, to be welcoming on the one hand, but then on the other side, there's this issue of free speech that we've got to balance at all times. As you, as pulling from your research, being a part of an academic community, are there recommendations that you might offer to us in terms of how we approach our work, the things we need to be looking at, looking for? Just give us some guidance built yeah. from, from, from your body of work, please. Yeah, no, I've been thinking about this and, and uh, you guys um, are working on the front lines on our campuses are in a really important position right now because um, as I was sort of mentioning in conclusion that the college campuses have become a target for the white nationalist movement. And uh, they think, that, you know, they wanna go there obviously because we've got young minds, right? young minds that are also impressionable and um, college campuses, you know, are, you know, easy to access and also, you know, there are ready-made audiences for them. Um, and it's a real important, um, it's a difficult decision, you know, uh, on the one hand, you hate to give them a platform because of the fact that that's their strategy. This idea of the Overton window, um, if you're interested in that, you know, uh, Google that and read about that. Uh, it's a real strategy where they think if they can dress up in suits and ties, um, if they can have PhD next to their name and they can be on a college campus, they're in a very legitimate space there. Mm -hmm. and, and the kind of things they talk about, there's like a, this intellectual, you know, air quotes, uh, wing uh, of the alt-right and the white nationalist movement uh, where there are academics who, um, you know, either claim to do research or, you know, ground their uh, arguments in research on what they call, you know, sometimes it's called race realism or, you know, human biodiversity. It's this, you know, strand of like psychological research on, on like IQ differences and group differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and they, of course, use that as a way of justifying, um, you know, inequality. And in fact, Charles Murray, if, if any of you have ever remember him, he wrote this book, The Bell Curve, back in 1994 that generated so much controversy and upset so many people, rightfully so. He's out with a new book that's basically doing the same thing, but now he's bringing gender into it as well. And mm -hmm. that book is reviewed on... Um, a website called American Renaissance, which is run by Jared Taylor. And it's, you know, it, uh, they have book reviews. I mean, it looks very intellectual and it mm -hmm. looks very legitimate. 
And so uh, here, actually last year, the University of Alabama, I think it was last fall, the fall before the pandemic, we actually have a speaker series in, at the University of Alabama on sort of evolutionary biology or something like that. It's the allele series. Somehow, as part of the series of speakers for that year, they invited in one of these race realist pseudo, I mean, he was a, he's a psychologist. He has a PhD, he's teaching at a university, I think in Florida. And um, he's not even on tenure track, but somehow he got invited and uh, we didn't find out to the last minute. Some students actually contacted me about him. They were the ones who found out. And so they went to his talk and they pushed back and, you know, um, but do we want to give that a platform? I think that's the question you guys okay. are probably not. Once they're invited though, we can't keep them from coming if they're invited by a legitimate student, you know, mm -hmm. entity. But I think the best thing we can do, so it turns out the allele people in charge of that speaker series said, oh, we have, he was subbing for someone and someone suggested him and we have no idea, we didn't know he was this person. Uh, just like I was contacted by Tom Sunick from the American Freedom Party, I almost said, yes, it sounded, because they say it will come for free, you know, no cost oh, wow. to you, you know, and um, you've got to vet your speakers. I think that's the best advice we can give people. And I don't think we want that platform. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm one of the ones who thinks that um, not everything deserves a platform, but. Um, right. so, so research and vetting of our speakers. I what, think just so want to put, education. So talk, can you talk about that a little bit more? We've got like two minutes, but what sort of, what sort, what sort of strategies can we employ to help young folks to be critical thinkers. Uh, I always tell them, I'm not trying to inoculate you, but, but I also don't want you to fall for this kind of thing that, that you were just talking about. I, yeah, I think especially for the student groups that are political, um, all of them for that matter, need to, uh, I think, just be advised to take the time you know, uh, to vet their speakers. Now, of course, when you have these alt-right student groups on campus, they're going to be specifically looking for mm -hmm. um, these types of speakers. I mean, I think the other thing we can do is just, you know, faculty just need to be aware of what they're signing up for. When a, when a student group comes to them and asks them to be their faculty advisor, they need to, you know, sort of keep an eye on them. And, and you know, that, that's kind of what happened here. Uh, at, at UA, um, uh, and fortunately that group never made it back on campus. All right. Well, Dr. Richard Fording, thank you so much uh, for your presentation today. I want to remind our audience that his book is Hard White, The Mainstreaming of Racism in America. It's available now. Uh, we have recorded this session. We also will provide you with a you'll have access to the link to his um, presentation uh, within a couple of days, and you'll get that along with your assessment for the workshop. Uh, I wanna let you know about what's coming up tomorrow. We'll have our final session tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Martha Crowther is gonna be moving us through a workshop on self-preservation, which is so very key with all that we're dealing with, an act of political warfare. So to that end, I want to, uh, on behalf of our president of Alajado, Dr. Paulette Dilworth, uh, and to all of our participating universities, Thanks to the team at UAB who's helping us out in a phenomenal way with the technology. And to you, Dr. Fording, thank you for making this such a powerful, powerful learning opportunity. We really appreciate your joining us here today. Thank you very much. And if anyone wants to ask any questions, you know, you're welcome to just Google me and, and send me an email. What I'll do is send you a lot of these questions that are, we'll save the questions in the Q&A because there were many that we couldn't get to. Okay. So that'd be great if you wouldn't mind responding to those so that I would love everybody, to. everybody could see it. Thank you again. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Have a good rest of your Wednesday, and we'll see you back again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.